welcome back to the Very Short Introductions podcast. New episodes will premiere every Thursday through to June. We hope you stick around to listen. From public health to Buddhist ethics, soft matter to classics and art history to globalisation, we'll showcase a concise and original introduction to a wide range of subjects for wherever your curiosity may take you. So here is today's Very Short Introduction. Hi, my name is Patricia Aufderheide. I teach at American University. And I had so much fun writing the very short introduction called Documentary Film, A Very Short Introduction. And I love those titles because they're exactly what the book is. So I've been writing about documentaries as a film critic and as an academic uh, for five decades now. And I've watched the field change so dramatically. When I started writing about documentaries, my friends would say, did you go to a movie this weekend or did you watch a documentary? And then there was this whole period where documentary was known as the D word. Like you could make a documentary, but please try to market it as a movie because because documentary is the kiss of death. And now documentaries are insanely popular. Uh, During the pandemic in 2020, Everybody who was stuck at home, I guess, decided to watch a documentary. Documentary viewing on streaming went up 120% in a year. And every producer of media, apparently in the world, decided to take a cue and make documentary films. So this is the absolute golden age for documentary viewing. You can see documentaries on every possible channel, and there are so many different kinds of them. It's almost hard to sort it out. And that was one of the challenges of writing the book was to say, well, what are what are different ways of understanding a documentary? Which I guess the basic question is, what is a documentary? And there are people who will tell you, oh, it's just impossible to define. And I, I actually don't think it's that hard. A documentary is a film that is an honest attempt by a filmmaker to say something meaningful about something that really happened. And the reason why I like that definition is because it's about the attempt to represent. There are people who, when they come to a documentary, kind of believe that they are just having a window opened on what happened, that documentaries are some kind of clean transmission to reality. There are other people who believe that everything is manipulated, and so we can't trust anything. And I am writing right down the middle. What I'm saying is all nonfiction work, whether it's a a book, a biography, or um, a news report, uh, or a documentary, or a blog, or a podcast, all of those are claims to to interpret something about reality, to tell you something meaningful about something that really happened. And if they are lying to you about something that really happened, if they made up that stuff, or if they did not have a good faith attempt to represent it in some way authentically, well, then it's either a different kind of art, like a fiction film, or it's just a bad documentary. I think it's not that hard to say, well, we expect to be looking at something that really happened. We expect to be looking at real people. We don't expect actors to be playing their roles unless they are labeled that way. And we have a reason to understand that it's what in filmmaking is known as a reenactment. But there's an enormous investment in documentary in being in good faith with the viewers and increasingly in good faith with the people who are making the film about as well. So another thing that happens with documentary is that people say, I I get students who say, I want to make documentary films, but I don't want to make the kind of boring films that have been made up until now. I want to make a really interesting documentary. And these are people who have not seen enough interesting documentaries. There are so many interesting documentaries. I had some wonderful Chinese students who were really upset to see this film called Man with a Movie Camera made by Tsiga Vertov in the age of the Russian Revolution. It was made for the 10th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. And 
they were upset because they in China had been editing a very boring biography series. And every week they had to edit, edit those, that series. And they were, they, they used to spend their time in the editing room, imagining what they could do if they could bust out of this formula and really use the, their creativity. And they said they were shocked because they found out that somebody had every one of their ideas in 1929. So there's so much exciting work in the past if you could tap into it, if you could know about it. And I tried to open some doors for people in writing this book to tell them about some of the exciting work done in the past. And that is also uh, something else that I took as my job to, to help people understand the, the wealth of documentary, to show them how many different ways a film can look to achieve different goals. There are documentary films done entirely in animation. There's a wonderful film uh, made by an Israeli called Waltz with Bashir, which is about his experience in uh, a war with Lebanon. And it's, it's poignant, it's really devastating and really effective. There's another film that's uh, animation called Flee, done very recently about a refugee and how he had to reimagine and retell and restructure his own experience in order to get this refuge and safety and loving relationships that he needed to survive. So it's not only about what happened to him, but it's about the progress of the many narratives that he created for himself, all done in animation. So you can also have a film that's a hybrid between fiction and nonfiction. Although I think the expectation of viewers is they would like to know what what is what. Recently, Morgan Neville made a film about Anthony Bourdain called Roadrunner. Anthony Bourdain, the famous food author, and he represented the voice of Anthony Bourdain by replicating it using artificial intelligence. And he was very, very proud of that, but he hadn't made that known before the film became public. And when people found out that he had basically they expected that they were listening to the voice of Anthony Bourdain, but they weren't. They were listening to artificial intelligence recreate the voice of Anthony Bourdain, although it was words that he had actually written somewhere. And they were very, very upset. So that was, to me, an example of how audiences behave when they feel that they've, they've been tricked in some way, which leads me to ethics, another really big issue in filmmaking, especially when it's documentaries. What are the ethical issues in filmmaking? This is actually a huge debate going on right now. And I discuss some of those hot issues in the, in the book, but it is a gift that keeps on giving in the documentary film world for sure. There's a film going on that just came out of the Sundance Film Festival for 2022 called Jihad Rehab, which is very controversial because people don't understand whether the Saudi government was involved in uh, making this film, whether the filmmaker had a minder and that minder affected what people did, and whether the filmmaker was able to provide a secure uh, environment for Yemeni men who she interviewed but who are stuck in Saudi Arabia, which is not exactly a friend to Yemen. And uh, they're basically under sort of house arrest in Saudi Arabia. Big, big ethical issues that, that people debate without having strict rules to go on because you know there never are really strict rules in ethics. There are guidelines and values and expectations, uh, but many situations. So the issues of how people behave well when making a documentary, are controversial. And one of, the, one of the things that I discuss in the book, but also have written about elsewhere, is the, the notion that filmmakers come to a film with a great hope that they will have an ongoing good faith relationship with the people they made the movie with, that they'll have a good faith relationship with the people who paid them to make the movie, and that they will have such a good faith relationship equally with people who watch the film. And it's very hard to do that in a 360 way. And we're still, we're still talking in many sectors of the field about what, what are the values we should uphold when any of those things comes into conflict and how should we best behave. Really, really uh, an exciting time for documentary because documentary is such a big deal right now and so many are being made. So the, I think the 
book is remarkably quite timely in a field that matters a great deal. And it matters a great deal for many reasons. But one of them is that studies show that people trust the information they get from documentaries more, almost twice as much as they do from news media, which to me is a little bit concerning given, given that uh, documentaries come from many different places with many different commercial imperatives and typically are not subject to journalistic standards. But that makes it even more important for people to understand what makes a documentary, what are the questions informing documentary, what ethical questions people grasp with documentary, what are the different kinds of genres of documentary because it's just so important in our world now. I really hope that, um, that you have a great experience watching documentaries and that it might help you to understand the form to be able to access the book. And I hope that you have as delightful an experience of watching and learning about documentaries that I did. You have a very, very rich field of documentaries to watch these days. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Very Short Introductions podcast. You can subscribe to our podcast on your favourite podcast app to receive new episodes directly to your feed. All of our episodes, new and old, can also be found on SoundCloud and YouTube at OUP Academic. Music